We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. Welcome to Football is Family, a podcast dedicated to the fan and fan experience. My name is Jeremy McFarland, and I want to look at the positive behind what makes football so enjoyable to watch and follow. I want to know why you are a fan of your team, of a player, or an era of football. Whether the pros, college, or high school, I want to hear and share your stories and your love for the game. If you want to be part of this podcast, please message me on Twitter at Jeremy underscore McFarland or on Facebook at the Footballist Family Facebook page. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Footballers Family Podcast. And I want to share uh, an experience I had yesterday, which would have been Tuesday the 17th. Uh, My daughter is eight years old. Excuse me, she's not eight years old. I have a daughter who's eight year old, but my daughter who is in eighth grade, uh, she is a cheerleader for the junior high football team. And we went to a game that she was cheering in just so happened to be in Centerville, Tennessee. Now what big deal is that Centerville is where I went to high school from 93 to 97. And I stood on the field of my alma mater. Now I've never went to a football game at that, high school when I was going to high school there that was the first football game I've been to there uh, I was what you would call a nerd like football love playing it outside and love playing it on uh tech mobile but never went to a game and all I was looking around is thinking that my daughter uh is now going and cheering at the high school that I attended never thought that would happen never thought that would happen but I thought it was pretty neat that during this time of season we are talking traditions and you know, high school on Friday nights, uh, my son plays for the band for the Waverly, uh, the Waverly Marching Pride there in Waverly, Tennessee. And, uh, you know, they have traditions there. And there's traditions in all sorts of country or parts of this country. Different high schools have different traditions. In Texas, there's eight-man football teams. Uh, a lot of good stuff, a lot of neat things that are tradition-based. <clears throat> Monday, I went to an open practice at Nissan Stadium there for the Titans. And I was watching dads take their daughters and their sons and have them sit and watch games. Of course, they didn't sit very long. In fact, most of the time I would watch the parents take their kids. The kids would get up immediately and run down, try to get on the field. Um, security kind of frowned on that, but they got it. You know, it was understood. understood. I, I would try to take my kids to games, and all they would want to do is watch my phone or eat. Uh, so the tradition is not there for that. But I remember a story about Mike Keith. He would go to, uh, he's the voice of the Titans. He would go to a junior high or elementary school, and he would tell the parents there that you guys might not be Titans fans because you grew up a probably more likely a Steelers fan or a Cowboys fan, but your kids will grow up with the tradition of the Titans. And they'll become Titans fans one day. And guess what's happening? Those kids that when the Titans came to Nashville or Memphis first and then to Nashville, those kids are now either having kids or will have kids soon that will grow up Titans fans. It's traditions like that that I really respect and uh, really, really appreciate. Uh, Before the Titans came to Nashville, uh, the only football we had up here was Vanderbilt. 
Vanderbilt Commodores. And I don't know if you really call that football, but it was the only thing we had. So I would go to, I've been to several games. In fact, I think I might go this year. Uh, I can go see East Tennessee State for $4. I may do that. It costs more to get up to Nashville than to go to the game. But there's really no tradition uh, with the Commodores. There's really not, nothing there. It was until I went down to Tuscaloosa, and my, where two of my children were born, that I started seeing traditions when it comes to football. And there's maybe some traditions in in uh, pro football, but there's a lot more traditions in college. And I and I found a, a website, NBCSports.com, mentioned several traditions that I want to talk about for a moment that I have seen on TV, but I don't have a lot to do with. And, and maybe you do. Maybe you do. One that they mentioned was the dotting of the eye on the Ohio. For the Ohio State, the marching band forms its traditional script, Ohio. And it's a special honor to be able to dot the eye while the word is being spelled out. And this actually began in 1936, but then later on, 1937, the director delegated a sousaphone player to dot the eye. And I've watched people do that. And boy, they really get into it. It's really neat. And I, I, I don't appreciate it as much as the people who are Ohio State fan or, or grads. It's a special honor to be able to dot the I. It goes on to talk about Howard's Rock. I'm not a Clemson fan, but I played NCAA football, and I played against Clemson several times. And Howard's Rock would be there, and people would touch it and rub it for luck. It says the rock was given to then head coach Frank Howard in 1960 by a friend. Originally, it stayed in the coach's office as a doorstop until it had been removed while cleaning his office. After The Rock left his office, it was placed in its current location, location cemented its legacy. After the team won its first game, The Rock was present against uh, Wake Forest. So Clemson fans, that's the reason why Trevor Lawrence was so good. It's because you had a rock that used to be a doorstop. But again, that's what football is about. You kind of go on and... And uh, many people in my area know about the vault walk there in Knoxville. And I've, I've never been to a game in Knoxville, been by the stadium, it's gigantic. Uh, but I know several of my friends who are fans of the Vols, they said that they go early to watch the vault walk, basically the, the team walking to the, to the uh, stadium from their locker rooms. And it's a big event. It's a big event. One, though, is talking about marching in. I am not a veteran. I didn't serve, uh, and I didn't go to any of the academies. But the Army-Navy game, which is a spectacle in and of itself, is an amazing game. It says, before each game, cadets and the midshipmen enter the stadium in various marching patterns on their way to be seated. The students are rarely seen seated during the game. This goes back, dating back to 1890. And the two teams now face off against each other in December, every December. If you've never watched one of these games, it is actually uh, one of those games that these, these kids really do it because they love the sport. Very rarely do you see any of these people make it to the NFL. That happens, but very rarely do you see that happen. Um, these, these kids will later on be leaders in our military and, and some even die for our country. So this is a tradition that, matters to them and I guess should matter to our country as well. Um, and it goes on. There's several more traditions, but the reason I kind of bring this up, and I want to talk a little bit more about traditions just a second. The reason I bring this up is uh, last week I was put on quarantine for COVID to be tested for COVID. And I was blessed not to have that. Uh, but many of you have had COVID or, or maybe have it in the future and it really does put things in perspective. Uh, things that really you think is not that big of a importance really become more important. Uh, in my in my house, when I was uh, growing up with my parents um, in Dixon, Tennessee, my mom made a, or I don't know, it might have been my granny or my grandmother, one of the two, one of the three, uh, made a little ornament. 
there's a little mouse stuffed mouse inside of a stocking and we put it up on our Christmas tree. Well, me being a little bit smaller at the time, I might've been one or two. I don't know. I put it at the very bottom of the tree because that's where I can reach and put it there safely. And it just so happened that it started a tradition that has lasted to today, but I don't do it anymore. It, went to my son, then it went to my middle daughter. And now it's at my youngest daughter who we adopted a few years ago. And I said, you are a McFarland now. Do you put this ornament up? And the first time she did that, uh, I didn't expect this. She started to cry. And I, and then she came over and hugged me. And I was like, what's going on? Well, I did a little bit more research on adoption for this. And they said that children who are adopted when they're a little bit older, she was almost two, uh, didn't have that growing up. They didn't have that tradition. They didn't have that uh, recognition of family dynamics like that. And even traditions that may seem insignificant to them, it means something because now they are part of a family that will do this every year. So COVID has really kind of brought up a lot of things in my life that I look at and I say, you know what? The traditions may seem silly, but it's normalcy. So when you look at some of the things that you may do, like homecoming, this there's another thing that says homecoming here. I went to a, a school that we are undefeated in football since 1869. We have not played football since 1869. We don't have a football team. Freed Armand University does not have a football team. But many of you who have gone to uh, colleges or universities that have football team know that the homecoming game is is a great game. Uh, I've been to several at at Vanderbilt, but the problem with that is most times you go to a homecoming game at Vanderbilt, it's the other team that out outnumbers the home. But you know that when you go to a homecoming game, you get to see where you where you went to school, or maybe where you're going to go to school one day. You get to see people that you graduated with, and not only that, you get to see uh, you get to see a lot of uh, neat things. You get to see the game being played and you get to reminisce about, about your past and about great things like that. Um, you know, looking at some of this, Ugga, Ugga, my brother-in-law and several of my family down in Georgia, are huge Georgia Bulldog fans. And yeah, I've got a friend of mine sitting right next to me. He's shaking his head. Yeah, I understand. I understand that too, but you know, teach their own. And they said, well, we're going to go see Ugga. Of course, I grew up, I knew Georgia football. I didn't know anything. What was Ugga? Ugga is the bulldog, the English bulldog. Now, this guy, I have started watching videos of him. This guy right here has it made. Has it made. If it's hot, if it's hot. Now, I have, I have a couple of Siberian Huskies at home. If it's hot, they look at me and say, get me back inside. They're not made for this weather. When it snowed here in Tennessee, they were happy. But this guy is not made for anything over 50-degree weather. They put ice for him to lay on. This guy has it worked out. In fact, it says here the first UGA, UGA, came in 1956, and each of the children of the original dog made up of seven total dogs that make up the UGA family lineage. When the UGA passes away, He's interred in a mausoleum near the football stadium. And when Anaga retires, he passes the bone in an elaborate pregame ceremony. Now, if you were to tell somebody that we're going to make a mausoleum for a dog, some people are like, no, that doesn't make any sense. But for people who are Georgia fans that respect that, not only does it make sense, but it makes perfect sense to them. Now, I grew up also uh, not understanding a lot about uh, other football teams in the sense like what, what traditions do they have? Later on, Vanderbilt would come up with something they would call the VC, where you take your, your fingers and you put it, your left hand especially, you put it, the two fingers up and it'd be a V, and then you put your pointer finger in your, in your thumb and make a C, and that's Vanderbilt Commodores. But in Texas, they have something called hook em horns. Well, they take their fingers and they would make it like a horn. You know, Texas Tech, 
does things like that, very similar to that. So does the Texas a and I guess it's a Texas thing. But that's a tradition that if you were to find somebody who is a Texas grad, they would do that. I have a friend of mine who uh, went to Texas A&M here from Waverly, went to Texas A&M. And she would say that they would go to a, a midnight yelling. What is that? At Freed Harbin, cur- curfew was at midnight. We wouldn't do that. Uh, if we yelled, we would get fined for it. But they said that they had their yell leaders, which were all men who were all part of the, uh, the ROTC. Midnight before a game, they would go and practice. And you think, well, that there's no way that that, that place is packed. That place is packed. Now, if you're a, if you're an Aggie, you understand that completely. For the rest of us, we might not understand that. It may not be that big of a deal. And you can go on and on. There's a lot of tradition in college football, a lot of tradition in, in pros, you know, of uh, the Green Bay Packers riding bikes to uh, practice during a training camp. But the thing is that I wanted to really emphasize is that if you've got a tradition in your life or your team has traditions or anything like that, value those things. Don't look down on them because they may sound silly. Because in this life where there's so much going on, normalcy is so hard to come by. Value it. Treasure it. Don't apologize for it. And honor it. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you next week. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to SportsHistoryNetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items. Plus, get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to SportsHistoryNetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items. Plus, get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.